Teleportation. It's not a subject that gets talked about much in church. Why is that? <laughs> I think teleportation is cool. I mean, we had it on Star Trek, right? Most famously, teleportation, we remember it happening at Easter time in the Bible. John 20, it says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you, right? The Bible makes it clear the doors are locked as if to say there's no way in, there's no way out, right? And then suddenly, bammo, Jesus is standing there. Now, you can call it what you will, he materialized, he appeared, but we both know he teleported, right? And it also happened at other times. In John chapter six, uh, Jesus gets into the boat after he walks on water. And then the Bible says uh, in chapter or verse 16, it says immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. An entire boat full of people. Wouldn't this be a great talent to use while sitting in traffic. You could just, you know, I dream of genie yourself and immediately your car and passengers are at their destination. Today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 8. At the end of the story it says, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. Verse 40 then after that says, Philip found himself at Azotus. That was 20 miles away. 20 miles away in the blink of an eye. The Greek word for translated, or the Greek word translated as caught away is harpazo. And it's the same word that we use when we talk about the rapture of the church. Well, I have to admit, I kind of grabbed you in with a hook. We're not actually going to talk about teleportation today at church. And I'm not going to give you a way to find out if it's your spiritual gift. But rather, I want to talk about the events that led to Philip being spirited away. Acts 8 verse 26 says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah, and the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice were denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? And then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Now, we have two main characters in this story. Let's start with the easy one, Philip. He's a disciple of Jesus. Uh, we see him in the Gospel of John. He convinced Nathaniel to join Jesus' disciples. He helped the Gentiles learn about Jesus' teachings, and he distributed the miraculous bread and fish to the multitude that Jesus fed. The second man is from Ethiopia, and we don't know his name. We only know a few things about him. He was employed by the court official uh, for the queen. He was in charge of all her treasure, which, if you think about it, the queen is the head of state, right? And her treasure would be the country's treasure, which makes him kind of half servant, half government official. So this is a man who is in a position of intelligence and visibility and accountability and trust. We could probably then extrapolate that he was also rich. For when you give somebody control over the entire nation's finances, you want to pay them well <laughs> so they're not tempted to steal. 
And we also know that he traveled a long way. From Ethiopia to Jerusalem is about 3,000 miles. So that's the distance from New York to LA, one way. And he does it, right? What does the Bible say is the reason he does it? To worship God, right? To worship God. And returning from his trip, we also see that now he has his own personal copy of the scriptures. And since the printing press wasn't invented, books were not always readily available to everyone. So this is something that had to be commissioned, purchased, and now he's bringing home. And also I would guess it was a Greek copy and not a Hebrew copy. I mean, even, even the Jews didn't speak Hebrew, they spoke Aramaic. So there's a number of Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem. So there was a, a Greek language scroll that was probably available at a certain cost. But let's just say it was a Hebrew copy. Then it would demonstrate even more extraordinary faith as this eunuch would have had to have learned to read Hebrew. Our story also takes place in the book of Acts. This is the first book after the four Gospels in the New Testament. And the book of Acts is called Acts, right? Because the book details the various deeds and actions of the very first Christian church. This story might be titled, Philip and the Ethiopian Eunuch in your Bible. And it's the first of three significant conversion stories that happen back to back to back in the book of Acts. And I would say that if you're thinking about Acts as a, as a whole and, and having a theme, I think the theme is found right at the beginning in Acts chapter one, verse eight. It says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this I think is the key to our story because there's two more details about our second character. And the first is Ethiopia is not the Ethiopia of today. Instead, this man is probably from modern day Sudan which means the Ethiopian eunuch was an African convert. He is black. Second, we also know this man is a eunuch. Eunuchs were employed in the Middle East, China, and they had one of two functions. Either they guarded the harem or they were servants of royalty. And we know that he was the latter, which begs the question, if this is just a nice conversion story about sharing the gospel, or it's gonna be some three-point sermon on baptism, why choose this story and not some other? I believe the answer lies in who this man is. Because remember how the story begins. It begins with a visitation from an angel, right? An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This conversion story, this baptism story, is orchestrated by God. So that's important because how often does an angel of the Lord interfere or give direct action to someone in their life? It's very rare, right? So this is a kind of let's sit up and pay attention kind of story. So when Philip first meets the Ethiopian eunuch, we see someone who is seeking something. He's diligent, he's sincere, he's earnest, he's not satisfied in himself, and he's reaching out for something that perhaps he doesn't know about. And perhaps during his visit, he was probably told about how Stephen was stoned to death. He was probably told about the Messiah, this man who claimed to be the Messiah, and his disciples, his followers. He would have seen converts to this new religion, and they all seemed happy, and they were all willing to share their faith. And he might have even heard one or two of the disciples teaching the crowds. And they were all there to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, this is in a day and age before newspaper, before cell phones, before TV, before radio. So if you have good news that you want everyone to know about, there's only two ways to get the word out. And, and, and one would be to live it out yourself, that you live it. And the other would be to talk about it. And that's what happened during the early days of the church. The early Christians drew other people to them because they had something special and other people that were on the outside who wanted to be on the inside saw that there was something there worth following. In the second century, 
The church father, Tertullian, wrote, See how these Christians love one another. That was the reason this movement was spreading. To reach the thirsty. To reach the thirsty. God used an angel and an evangelist to reach out to this thirsty soul. He visited Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. He's returning home now to his town. And so the Spirit led Philip by an unmistakable voice, right? God directed Philip to the right person at the right time. And we know that the word of God was already in the chariot because the Ethiopian is reading from the book of Isaiah out loud. Interestingly, Philip was guided first by an angel in verse 26 and then by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Spirit prompted him after he got there as if to say, this is the reason you are here. In case you were wondering where to go or why you're here, that's the reason you're here. In verse 30 says, Philip ran to him, heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? This was customary uh, in the ancient times for people to read out loud. Philip could have easily heard the portion of scripture that he was reading. In verse 31, he says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is what I meant about someone who is thirsty. You know, Psalm 42 says, as a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And he is profoundly interested, the eunuch, in what he's reading. He just couldn't understand it. And he says, I, you know, I, how can I understand this unless I have a teacher, unless somebody guides me? And there's a little bit of discontentment there, right? So he invites Philip to come up, sit with him, and he is asking for instruction. And then Philip gets to preach to the needy. To preach to the needy. Verse 32 says, Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this, As a sheep led to the slaughter, or a lamb before its shearer is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. And in his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. Now this quote is from Isaiah 53, it's verses 7 and 8. And since the time of Jesus, we know this passage now, now, right, is about Jesus. So it's prophecy. But before Jesus, even the Jews didn't understand that this was a messianic passage. They didn't know that this was about the Messiah. They didn't understand that there was a suffering servant or that this portion of scripture was going to be speaking about Jesus. So in 34, the eunuch says, about whom, pray, does the prophet say this, about himself or about somebody else? So this passage is from Isaiah. It's perplexing to the eunuch. He knows the passage is talking about an individual, but he doesn't know who, right? So it's either the author or somebody else. And it's, it's not strange that he's confused, right? Even Jewish experts back then didn't understand the meaning of this passage. But what a wonderful opener for Philip, right? <laughs> to begin preaching to the needy. Philip picked up the conversation right right where the eunuch is, you know, right, right where he's sitting, right where he's living, and he communicates the gospel of Christ through this book, the book that he was reading. Verse 35 says, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news of Jesus. I think when the Spirit of God leads, everything just opens up wonderfully. Everything just falls into place naturally. He's going to take the things that are confusing and make them clear. And I think that we need to trust that if we can take that same leap of faith, God is going to make things clear to that needy soul. Philip shows the eunuch that the passage he was reading was the prophecy about Jesus. And this goes back to Jesus' own teaching that he had come to serve, right? Jesus said in Mark 10, for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And we're going to we're going to see by the end of the story, the Holy Spirit is doing a work in this man's heart. And it's not enough for him just to read the words on the page or to have head knowledge. He wants to know more, right? He wants to understand this plan for salvation. And so I would just maybe jump out of the sermon, this, this talking story real quick, and maybe touch on some points about sharing the gospel. 
right? We don't, we don't have the text where Philip shares the gospel. We don't see what he says. And so I think oftentimes when we say, oh, just share the gospel, we kind of want a little bit more instruction, right? And I would say, you know, first, sharing the gospel is as easy as sharing any good news. That's how you think about it. Just any good news that you have, think about it the same way. What, what are you going to start with? Who Jesus is, what he's done, who we are as sinners, right? Self-identify as a sinner, and why you personally needed the work of Christ in your life. That's the gospel, right? That's the gospel. And that belief in Christ and belief alone results in salvation. Sharing the gospel is not about winning an argument. Sharing the gospel is not about being the smartest person in the room or having all the Bible verses memorized or uh, turning that conversation and convincing that person and winning the argument. That is not sharing the gospel. That is not our job. Our job is to present the gospel clearly, clearly. Now, you might say, well, I don't ever see opportunities to share the gospel. I would argue, I bet you the opportunities are everywhere and you just don't even notice it. For instance, uh, somebody could say, so how's your day? What do we usually say? Fine, right? Good, great. Or you could respond with something that's spiritual. You could say, you know what? My day is blessed. I am so grateful to be a child of God. That's an open door right there, right? How about, uh, hey, you got plans for the weekend? Well, you know, always, we go to church. I go to church, I go to Walden Community Church every Sunday. Oh, really, right? When people ask you, what are you doing this weekend? <laughs> what do you say? Oh, just hanging out, doing some chores, doing some laundry, you know, nothing big. How often are you asked, how was your weekend? How was your weekend? It was good. Or, you know, we had a great Sunday experience at church. Our pastor started talking about teleportation and I was like, where is this going? Right? I would argue that there are ways, right? Ways that we can respond back spiritually if we just stop and think about it and allow that door to be opened. You know, if you think about the situation we have right here with Philip and the eunuch, the eunuch really started the conversation by reading out loud, and Philip just tuned into that. You know, he just, and he naturally just asks a question. Instead of remaining silent, he asks the question, do you understand what you are reading? Right? Simple question. Simple question. And verse 35 says, then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And I think you got two things right there. Two, two easy points about sharing the gospel right there. Number one, Philip opened his mouth. What a weird sentence, right? Of course he opened his mouth. Why, why write that down? Why mention it? Because how often do we bite our tongue? How often do we say nothing? How often do we say, well, you know, pfft, I, I don't want to say anything. I didn't want to get involved. It's, it's, not my, it's not my business, right? Philip chose to make it his business. Philip chose to get involved with a stranger. But the gospel is never going to get out there unless more of us are willing to open our mouths. And the second thing we see is that Philip starts right where the man is, Right? He doesn't say, well, let's talk about this other book. Well, let's talk about this other story. Let's talk about this other thing. Or let's talk about me. Right? He doesn't shift the conversation to himself. He picks up right where the man is and uses that, the book of Isaiah, as a jumping off point. And he uses the tools and he uses the relevance that's right in front of him. We don't need to make sharing the gospel any more complicated than that. And then we begin the teaching on baptism. Baptism is one of the most beautiful expressions 
of what God has done in a person's life, I think the symbolism of the water clearly shows us that our sins and our past life, our old self is washed away in Jesus. And that when we come back out of the water, we can start a fresh new life that's clean and forgiven. Plus, when you get baptized, you are giving everyone else this beautiful message that you are preaching, right? You are, you are sharing the gospel right there visually for everyone to see and to hear. Your baptism is a profession of faith, and it becomes a visual picture of the gospel. I mean, think about it. I bet there's somebody in your family that needs to hear the message of God's grace, and I, I bet you they would never come to a Christmas concert, and they wouldn't come to an Easter service. But if you asked them and said, hey, I'm getting baptized in two weeks, I would really like you to be there. They would come. I bet you they would come to watch you get baptized. And your baptism could be the gospel message that they need to see and to hear. I honestly believe that every believer should be baptized in order to show the world the grace that's been done in their life. And because Jesus told us to do it, that's why we call it an ordinance. Because it was one of two orders that came from Jesus. He says in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So being baptized not only shows our faith in Jesus, but it also shows our obedience to Jesus. The Ethiopian said, Look, here is water. What keeps me from it? And so I would ask that same question of you. Maybe it's time for you to take the plunge and show the world the grace of God in your life. Don't let fear or pride or anything else keep you from this. And if I, I, I say, if, if you need to get baptized, if you want to get baptized, take that step of faith. The road to Gaza crosses several riverbeds, and that salvation experience for that Ethiopian was so real. He said, I want to get baptized immediately, right? So he stops the caravan at the very first appearance of water. Verse 38 says, he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. Now this is where we see Philip teleported. Told you I'd get to it, right? But the Ethiopian man, the Bible says he leaves rejoicing. That's how it should be. That's how it should be when you hear good news. That's how it should be when you are welcomed in from the outside. That's how it should be when you are told, yes, yes, even you belong. You belong. There should be rejoicing. And you know, we don't hear anything about this uh, Ethiopian after this story. But what I hope, I hope he was so excited that he opened right back up to that book of Isaiah and he kept on reading because eventually he would have got to Isaiah 63, 65, verse 3 that says, Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. The very book he was reading had a personal message just for him. Don't call yourself separate from my people. Don't call yourself separate. The good news is about belonging and it's about acceptance. And this book is not about how bad you are. It's about how great God is. The Ethiopian now has knowledge and he goes away rejoicing. Not searching any longer, no longer feeling like he's on the outside. Bible says he's filled with great joy. You know, the Ethiopian Coptic church, which survives to this day, traces its origin back to this single moment. And their current membership is at 36 million believers. What a difference one person can make when they live their life 
obedient to God, and they are willing to share the gospel. And it's not just something Philip can do. All of us, all of us can be an evangelist for God. Every one of us can be used by God to bring somebody else into a saving relationship with Christ. Every one of us can help more people come in from the outside. It's all about more Christians and better Christians and about loving God and loving others. Each of us is a minister. Let's pray. Lord, what a beautiful Sunday. It's so wonderful to see these uh, church members and these students baptized today. It's so, so beautiful to see the willingness to be baptized and to share their faith. Lord, we just pray for each one today who was baptized and who walked through the waters of baptism. Lord, we just pray that those listening to this message right now, those in this room, if there is any that, that might be thinking, this, this is something I should do. Like I, I would, Lord, I would just pray that you would continue to encourage them with your spirit, that they would find that courage, that they would find that um, desire to also make that profession of faith. Lord, we pray for just those who continue to still need to hear the gospel message. And if, Lord, they are in our lives right now, if they are in our week to week, Lord, I just pray that more of us would have that same prompting of the Spirit to open our mouths and to share good news. How beautiful our hands and feet when we share the good news. Lord, we thank you for all you've done for us, each and every blessing, and we ask that you walk with us as your church each and every day. Amen. Hey, thanks for coming out and uh, worshiping with us this Sunday. We're so glad to see you out there. Uh, of course, you are always welcome to share this message, especially if you wanted to maybe share it with somebody you thought might need to hear it. You know, there's a URL address up there. You can just clip and copy it. You can post it to your Facebook wall uh, and let everybody else know what you uh, were studying or what you were watching. And of course, we would love to have you here. You know, we are here every single Sunday. We have a 9.30 service. We have a choir. We're going to sing all of your traditional hymns. We have responsive readings. We have the Lord's Prayer. We have communion. And so it's going to feel like the same church that you grew up with. And then we have coffee and donuts in between that time where we encourage fellowship. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Please come dressed as you feel uh, casual and feel comfortable. We also have a full children's program at that hour from birth all the way through high school. And during the week, every single Wednesday, we have youth group at 5.30 for junior high and high school. Please send your kids over at 5.30. We'll feed them pizza. They get an hour of games and then they'll get a lesson and then we'll send them home to you in about two hours. Hey, thanks for watching. Please reach out to us. Go to our uh, website, waldenchurch.com. If you have any questions, call us, drop by. We would love to be at the church where you live. I'll see you next week. Bye.